Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and the show has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, and Welp Magazine has listed Dare to Dream as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. Very grateful for that. And I love watching where this show is trending all over the world. It's really amazing to me um, where you guys are at. So thanks also for writing. When you do, when you leave feedback, I read all of it and I do my very best to get back to everybody. And I feel the same as you. I'm really glad you're encouraged and you're motivated by some of the insights and wisdom that you learn here in these conversations. It's curiosity certainly that drives me. So I'm glad that you are just as curious as I. I wanna thank the sponsors for the show, Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do amazing energy work out into the world. And if you'd like to check them out, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. And I myself, outside of this amazing 14-year podcast show, I am a book writing coach. I help you write a highly engaging book, also a page turner. And I also help take your book to a guaranteed international best-selling book status. And I show you the ultimate visibility formula how you can get booked on radio and podcast interviews and get massive results. I actually have a special coming out really soon around that. So what I recommend is go get your free gift at debbiedashinger.com slash gift. It's uh, templates, it's videos that teach you the process, how you can start to be interviewed to get your message, your business, your being out there. And then when I roll out my new bundle program, we're going to be running this crazy, awesome special of my programs around books and around being interviewed, and there's going to be some live Zooms with me. So if you want to know about that, I'll start by offering some free webinars to get some information taken care of. When you sign up at debbiedashinger.com slash gift, you will be in the know whenever that rolls out. And besides getting your fabulous gift. I've got a guest who was kind enough to come back to the show because the first time I know it left me wanting more. And it opened up a lot of insight for me about what was going on, because most of, as you know, extraterrestrial conversation that we've had on the show is really with extraterrestrials and with people um, who channel extraterrestrials or have had firsthand experience. This particular gentleman um, really works tirelessly, a lifelong mission of his to help us in the area of government so truth can finally be exposed. So this episode brings light to extraterrestrial government-related issues during the era of exopolitics. And my guest again is Stephen Bassett. He's the executive director of Paradigm Research Group, founded in 1996 to end a government-imposed embargo on the truth behind the UAP phenomenon. Stephen has spoken to audiences globally about the implications of formal disclosure by world governments of an extraterrestrial presence engaging the human race. He's given thousands of radio and television interviews and PRG's advocacy work has been extensively covered by national and international media. He's done so many fabulous things around disclosure, citizen hearing on disclosure and uh, hearings on Capitol Hill because he really wants to make sure in his lifetime and ours that this extraterrestrial real presence and the issue that the government is giving us around exposing the truth to see that ended. And if you would like to learn more about him and the great work he does, go to paradigmresearchgroup.org. And with that, I bring Stephen back to Dare to Dream. So great to have you. We can't hear you, but we can see your beautiful face. Can you get your audio going? I think you're, Uh, there he is. uh, I've got to go back to communication school so I can learn to (laughs) unmute the mic. (laughs) I'm so glad you're here. Mic or no mic, tech or no tech. It's great to have you back. I mean, I really meant that like our interview left me wanting so much more information from you. And I can see the way people respond to you. You know, I always research you before you come on the show. So I've, 
watched a bunch of your videos and gone through your website again. And it's really cool to see how people respond to you. Like there's a lot of support for you in getting the truth out. What is that like for you, your engagement, so to speak, with the public, with people like me, lay people? On the one hand, I'm very happy that people have responded to me and my message. Uh, I try to put out a message that is constructive, positive. Um, and uh, I have had supporters all these years. And I'm half proud to have a 23,000 Twitter followers and 12,000 Facebook followers. So that's a good thing. But I really need 100,000 Twitter followers. I need even more support and more people. And that's because things are really getting very intense and we're getting close. But you get what you, and I, and I have it. I'm not someone that sells himself. I'm not, I don't do that. I just do good. what I have to do and I hope to follow. And so in a sense, I'm, I'm the one probably chiefly responsible for not having an even larger, how would you say, uh, supporter base. But I've done, God, 13, 1400 interviews. So millions of people have heard me. But these days, and I talked to you about that, may talk to you some more. These days, you need to understand how to build an internet presence and a following um, because that is really what is necessary if you're going to achieve a, 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 get your message across and have impact. It's just the nature of the world today. But the people that have supported me all these years, I love everyone. Yeah, beautiful. I totally do understand the idea about having a large platform and what they can give you. So just so we can support you right now, where would people go if they say, I'll support them, I'll go to Twitter, I'll be a follower, I'll go to Facebook, et cetera, Instagram, where do they go? Well, Paradigm Research Group, if you search on that, you'll get my website and you'll get Twitter account. Uh, and I'm Steve Bassett on Facebook uh, and easily uh, found. So uh, that's really it, but the website is key. Uh, there's a place there to contribute, to subscribe, and a great deal of information. Uh, so paradigmresearchgroup.org is home base. Okay. And from there, I have links to all the social media. Perfect. Easy peasy. So are you still, Stephen, the only registered lobbyist in the United States that's representing these ET-related phenomenon, research, activist organizations, and the political implications of extraterrestrial mm -hmm. phenomena? No. No. Uh, about a year ago, a couple of gentlemen registered UFO PAC. Mm. So they, and uh, there, for a brief while, there was a, an, another person in registered, but then they, they had to cancel that. So I was one, then I was two, then I was one again, <laughs> and now UFO PAC. Now I haven't had a chance to look into what they're up to and what they're doing. Okay. I will, but it's nice to have company. Uh, I hope they have way more money than I have. <laughs> that, that'll help them. Uh, but uh, I'm not surprised. I'm surprised there aren't dozens more based on everything that's happening uh, on the Hill and the political implications of this issue. However, let's be clear, you don't get paid to do this. And raising money to do this is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way it is. And that's the truth embargo was specifically designed to prevent that from happening. It was designed to prevent people from becoming lobbyists or writing articles or being witness or anything else. And it was pretty much effective. And it still to some degree is effective. But eventually that will change and uh, uh, hopefully soon. You recently spoke at the Conscious Life Expo here in Los Angeles. I know you did a presentation, you spoke, you were on this amazing panel. And I'd love to know how that was for you, if anything was generated because of it or anything shifted. I don't think anything shifted really. The most important thing about it, it was live. It was the first live audience I'd stood in front for nearly 23 months. Wow. And that was nice. Mm -hmm. It wasn't much of an audience, but that's because the conference was also streamed. Uh, it, it, the world is never going to be the same after this pandemic, which is to say, and, and, and in a countless way. But here's one. Uh, Conferences, almost without exception of any size, are going to be in person and live streamed. They're going to be online and they're going to be in person. If you're not online, you got a problem. 
Now, the beauty of that is that the potential audience for a conference is huge uh, in terms of online, not to mention the fact that someone could, could be watching and paying to come to your event from Bulgaria, from the Antarctic, whatever. But because of the pandemic, the learning curve on people understanding all of these online modalities, like Zoom, for instance, all right, which we're on right now, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, Skype, and, and there are others that are turning up, including virtual platforms where you have avatars. The learning curve is like straight up. And so now hundreds of millions of people get that. And so when the pandemic slows down, oh, they're coming out because they want to be in person. They want to have that contact. They'd like to be in the audience. I get that. And that's going to help. But the, the online is, is sales is what's going to really change things and, and provide more income for these events. So I was there with a small audience. How many online don't know, but uh, uh, it was great. It was great to see some old friends again. I had some wonderful chats in the bar. Uh, <laughs> I had my mask, I had my shield. I did uh, you know, what I could to be as protected as possible. And I don't think any problems developed there. It's a new age, new time. I hope that the human race adjusts accordingly to what has just happened because nature does not forgive those who uh, don't take it serious. Mm. Yeah. Well, I hope to see you there in February. I'm, I'm hoping to be there live myself. So if you're going back again, I know they're, they are planning to be live again in February. So I definitely want to go. Um, so I'm sure I'll be there. I can't well, imagine uh, that Serena won't invite me again. I'm sure I'll be there. I'm sure you will too. And we'll hang out at the bar. Shields yes. and all. Okay. Definitely. They have fantastic, what was it I got there? Chicken wings, I think. Ah. There's some good stuff in that bar. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I know the hotel very well. Yeah. From the I years and years of doing press media for Conscious Life Expo. So yeah, I will definitely be there. And um, I, I am so curious. Here's a question for you, Steve. In the ET world, do you have a bucket list? Is there someone you wish so much, you know, one of those dinner questions, if you could sit down at dinner or just hang out over a cup of coffee or a chicken wing with somebody who is in the ET world today, who would that be? Who have you not yet connected with, but in your heart you would love to have access to? Hmm. There are many, many, many. Uh, I, I think I have an easy answer to that. The person that I would like to have, even if it was off the record private conversation with, they would never go anywhere else. I would like to sit down with former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And I would like to ask her this question. Senator, or rather, Madam Secretary, why didn't you take the UAP issue much deeper in that election? Why didn't you say so much more that you knew for fact? Because if you have, and I'm just, I'm just speaking about politics and the way things went, I'm not campaigning here. If you had, you would have won that election and we would have already been four years into the post-disclosure era. I have a Tough big question. question for you around that. That's fascinating, Steve, because I would think, especially the way the government sets things up, that people who speak out about that, ooh, ooh, right, they're crazy. I would think that here she is going to be, hoping to be the first woman president that if she were to have spoken out about the ET UFO situation with all that she knew at the time, that she would be concerned about being denigrated for speaking out. And here you're saying something contrary to that. You're saying actually she would have won. So what do you know about that? Well, first, 2016, 15 was not 1969. It wasn't 2000, it wasn't 2010. One of the reasons I produced a citizen hearing on disclosure at the National Press Club spent six, seven, $700,000 in order to show what a real 
hearing would look like with 30, 42 witnesses over five days was to show the Congress what that it's okay. These are great witnesses. Had six former members of Congress were asking wonderful questions. It was all live stream. God knows how many thousands of people watched it. Did that, I think got some coverage. And then in late, uh, well, early 2015, I started pushing the connection between the Clintons, both of them and John Podesta and the issue going all the way back to the 1990s and the articles started appearing. And as the articles appeared and they received questions from the press, which they did not respond to, they realized they needed to speak to the issue. That was the whole point, whether they wanted to or not. And so those articles started coming out. Eventually there was over 400 of them before, by the time of the election. And guess what? If you go and review these articles, and I have them linked on my website, some of the links have gone bad, but I have almost most of those articles saved up and I'm gonna replace the, the live link with a on, on uh, you know, a server. The PDF, yeah. yeah. Uh, she was getting good coverage. Hmm. She was getting a great response to this. He was generating lots of press. There was and virtually no criticism coming back from the Republican Party, the Republican National Committee, because most of the high IN people in the Republican Committee and Party know full well there's an ET presence. They've known it for a long time. It was going fine. It was some of the breast press she was giving, getting. So it, 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 she. And she and she saw that, but she was sufficiently concerned that if she went too far, it could be a problem, and, and it might affect her campaign, mm. which was not and not it was a legitimate concern. Right. But we're talking about history at the highest level here. We're talking about a transformative event. We're talking about someone who literally has the opportunity to end the truth embargo, even perhaps during the campaign. Because if they had really gone into this issue appropriately, if they had demanded that the, 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 those multimillionaire news uh, people, new, uh, television news hosts that pretty much dominated all of the committee, all of the, um, um, the uh, campaign debates, had re demanded, requested, asked me about this. She could have become one of the most influential, important politicians of all time. If you want that kind of glory, you have to be bold. What the problem with American politics right now is everybody is running scared out of their britches. They're so afraid to do anything. And the few that do something, if it doesn't immediately get results, people say, see, see what you're doing? Where are the bold, where's the brave? Where are those that are devoted to history and not just to winning? She couldn't go there. Now she's not the only one that has been faced with that extraordinary opportunity and not able to do that. I respect that. I'm not really beating up on her. I just would love to ask her, what specifically, why did you choose to play it soft? You were already committed. You were already out there. Blame me for that. I'm sure they do, but I didn't see it as trying to hurt your campaign. I saw it as trying to get the truth to the American people. And as it happened, you're the one with the connection to the issue. Your husband had the connection to the issue. John Podesta had the connection. People knew that. There's been tons of articles going about 20 years on it. So you were set up to grab that brass ring. You were set up to make that history. It was right there in front of you. Mm. And you didn't Must do so be very frustrating. Okay, so it would be Hillary Clinton. Very interesting. I want to talk a little bit more history with you because mm, one project of importance during your career, Steve, was publicizing the pretty complex issues on behalf of former Area 51 employees. Can you talk specifically about what were their grievances? What was your involvement with all of that? Uh, to be, uh, I just want to correct that a little bit, uh, supporting the nuclear weapons tampering witnesses. All right. Not, they're not really Area 51. Uh, 
they are in fact the, the SAC base officers that were serving at various missile sites starting in the mid 60s, continuing forward, some of which, many of which have never come forward involving events that may be as recently as not that many years ago, supporting these witnesses. Now, the most important one is Robert Salas, who was present at the Malmstrom Air Force Base incident in 1966, I believe, or 67, I should know that. He came out some time ago, oh God, 20 years, and I, and I learned about it, and I was paying close attention, and I understood how important that was. Now, Bob wasn't just content to be someone who finally decided, I'm gonna come forward and tell my story, which he did about how the missiles suddenly all were turned off after he was given a call from topside from the security people that there's a 40 foot orange thing hanging directly over the fence. He told that story, he told it again and again. Eventually he hooked up with Robert Hastings and they wrote an incredibly important book called UFOs and Nukes, which where Robert actually went and interviewed something like 200 people. Mm. It's the crowning achievement of his life. And he helped get more witnesses. In other words, Bob became an activist in addition to a witness. He's actually trying to form more witnesses. He's talking to them, encouraging them, maybe come forward and so forth. And working with Bob Hastings on that. The book was, was, was published. Then they held a press conference in Washington, DC in 2010, where six of those witnesses uh, presented in the national press. I was there to a sizable room full of journalists. And then they made a documentary called UFOs and Nukes, The Secret Revealed. And then they appeared at the, 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 the citizen hearing on disclosure. And in all of that time, all 20 years, not a single member of Congress, a committee member or committee chair called any of them and said, we think you need to come in and testify. Not a single, major newspaper, any newspaper, frankly, ever wrote an article about how, wow, nuclear facilities officers with the highest clarity clearances who were given the power to turn the keys and launch nuclear wars after passing every conceivable test and psychological profile, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but a half a dozen and others are saying they were present when the nukes were all turned off, which is impossible in succession with UAP craft hanging over the SAC facility. Why would you want them to testify before Congress as a matter of national security? Now, let me tell you why. The nuclear witnesses, tampering witnesses, all several hundred of them, of which a limited number have been able to come forward, many are dead, and many are just not ready yet to take whatever heat they may receive. Right? These are the most important UAP witnesses, period. No one else is even a close second. And they are unimpeachable. And thus they pose the greatest problem for the Department of Defense and the truth embargo in general. Somewhat similar to the problem of Philip Corso, Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso, who was a highly respected, decorated intelligence officer in World War II, including the, you know, the campaign in Italy, who got tasked to be part of the foreign technology desk and eventually came forward and had a book written about his experience, he wrote a book with a co-author about receiving access to Roswell technology, Roswell technology from the Roswell crash vehicle, being involved in seeing how that might be utilized to help American uh, technology, actually seeing a dead alien on transit to uh, Riley, O'Reilly, Kansas, Air Force Base. He was unimpeachable, he was old, but he was unimpeachable. So you know what the you know what the, the, uh, the there was nothing that the Department of Defense could do, or the Army could do. What come forward and say he's insane? Uh, 
uh, cast, uh, undermine his credibility by putting out false accusations that he, I don't know, committed fraud or tax evasion or whatever? Kill him? No. You know why? Because if they did that, there's a whole lot of high level army officers that would note that and would be extremely unhappy. And so what the DOD did was do nothing. Just don't touch them. Eventually they came out with a whole press conference and an Air Force report refuting the Roswell events, case closed, cost 12 million bucks, I think, headed by Sheila Widnall. They put that up there, gave a press conference about it at the, at the uh, DOD, complete lie. They didn't, they didn't attack Phil Corso because they couldn't. Interestingly enough, at the same time, the DOD was completely ignor ignoring the existence of Philip Corso. His book, The Day After Roswell, was the hottest selling book in the Pentagon bookstore. So now let's talk about the nuclear witnesses. What do you do if you're the Air Force and the Department of Defense? And if one SAC base after officer after another is saying, I was present when our nukes were shut off while ET craft were or UAPs were hanging over the SAC base flight. You're going to kill them? You got to put out stories in National Enquirer how they had affairs? What are you going to do? Let, let me tell you something. If they had gone after these men, the whole cadre of retired SAC based officers and others with high security clearances would have been outraged and they could have been up to their ears in witnesses. And so you know what they did? Mm -hmm. They pretended they didn't exist. No response at all. No attempt to refute them. I mean, you could refute them. You could say, well, I, I'm sure Doc, um, uh, Captain Salas, uh, Captain Pestermacher, Captain uh, Shindella, I, I'm sure that you were just having a bad day, a migraine perhaps. Uh, you were under stress. Maybe your wife was leaving you. I think you mistook the whole thing. No, mm. there was nothing they could do. And so they did nothing. Now the press knew about these, these events. Hell, the Minot paper wrote about the damn event in 1967. Articles were coming out in, in the early aughts. Research, of course, there's, there's, there's Robert Hastings' book. That came out, I don't know, 10 years ago? He should have been called into the Congress to testify instantly. Mm -hmm. But, but the press went along with it. The <laughs> press have written stories. I've got, you can find them. Hell, they wrote 100, maybe 200 stories of articles about the press conference of 2010. They're linked on my website. And then they stopped. They wrote it up. They didn't go to the Pentagon. Comment, please. Any truth to this? No, they wrote it up like good journalists do. And then after about two months, it stopped. Hmm. Some, oh, that's, a, that's another, I'd like to sit down with the publisher of the New York Times at that time. I think it may have been Schultzberger, I know who it was, but I'd like to sit down with that publisher. And I'd like to say, sir, what was your reasoning after the book came out about the nuclear weapons tampering with all of those witnesses, or after the press conference in particular of 2010, that this was not a story you needed to investigate and follow up on. Exactly, how did you calculate that? You don't have contacts at the Pentagon. You've got multiple Pentagon correspondents that are there at press conferences all the time. They could have asked about it on dozens of occasions. What was your reasoning? What were you told not to do and mm -hmm. by who? How did you miss it? And so, yeah, now, as it happens, Bob Salas did a GoFundMe and raised enough money to hold another nuclear weapons press conference on October the 19th at the National Press Club. I provided some assistance. There were less press there than before, many less press, except this time, unlike 2010, it was live streamed and there were thousands of people watching the live stream. So if you're some skittish publisher or skittish journalist, or if you're a uh, skittish politician or committee chair or just a skittish whoever, 
and you were no way going to come down and be seen live at that press conference. You could watch the whole thing live. But they went further. They also filmed it with a press club camera crew, and it's on YouTube right now. You can see a link. Uh, well, you can you can just do a YouTube search on uh, UFO in Newt's press conference or whatever, it'll come right up. It's about two hours. It's only just beginning to get spread around. Believe me, we have plans for that video. And so let's just say the impact ultimately of the October 19th uh, press conferences where four of the witnesses again told their stories, handed out affidavits for another 15 more. I have copies of them. I assure you this is not over. So, but, I'm not too upset. You want to know why? Because I can assure you that there is going to be congressional hearings on the UAP issue as soon as this political Michigas fiasco is settled down. I'm not worried about the pandemic. That is going to settle down. The political thing, not so sure. But as soon as it's set, they will be UAP hearings, and we will start almost certainly with the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is currently chaired by Mark Warner and co-chaired ranking member Marco Rubio. I call them the two Marks or the Marx Brothers. <laughs> and the most important witnesses, and they will be there, are the nuclear weapons tampering witnesses. And it's possible that when those hearings are called, and they will then have a chance to not just be a witness and talk to some UFO researcher or talk to some journalist, but rather to sit down in front of committees under oath and tell their story. There could be 50 of them mm. ready to go to Washington and testify. Yeah. So prepare for that. Those are the people I support. They are the most important witnesses in the world right now. They have been waiting for years. They are now in their 80s and 70s. Some of them are dying off, but they're not going to be able to die off fast enough for those that are committed to the truth embargo until the last dog dies. <laughs> no, they're going to testify. I hope that wasn't too long an answer to that very simple question. <laughs> it's Well, it's a fleshed out answer, and I really appreciate it. And so... Again, back in history, Steve, didn't you also cover stories, uh, cover-ups, statements that were made by Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell, also government cover-ups, claims of nuclear weapons being tampered by the ETs to save us and save our planet. Can you hmm. talk about that and some of those revelations? I got two things there. Let's start with Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell a national hero, got the Medal of Freedom. And he, he founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which is involved primarily in consciousness studies, which is getting a new research. The concept of consciousness, uh, Jeffrey, Dr. Jeffrey Michelow just got a $500,000 award for, uh, from Robert Bigelow and the Bix Foundation for writing uh, the best essay on the concept of consciousness and its potential to perhaps preside and last beyond uh, an individual's life. But Edgar Mitchell was involved in that way back, way back. He was doing, um, how would you say, consciousness related or a, a, a little research when he was on the way to the moon. He, he was working with some people on earth and they were doing some tests. Anyway, he came back and he founded ions. He, eventually was drawn into this issue. And early on, he stated, matter of factly, based on uh, conversations that he had, that Roswell was a, a crashed extraterrestrial vehicle, bodies were obtained. And he repeated that over and over for years. He spoke at two of my X conferences. He spoke at the X conference press conferences afterward. He spoke, uh, at, he introduced by uh, on camera remotely the citizen hearing on disclosure. He, he was the most outspoken astronaut of both the Mercury and Apollo astronauts on this issue. 
And for that, NASA tried to embarrass him, hurt him, but he continued. The other person, the other astronaut, by the way, that I think really will go down with uh, in history is, is someone who really tried, and that is, of course, Gordon Cooper. He was older than Gur, died sooner, but Gordon, to the extent he could, tried to get out the fact that, look, I've seen some things, and this is not human. Good for it. There have been a few others that have made some very statements, but Edgar Mitchell was the most outspoken. And I got to know him a little bit and uh, read his book. History will vindicate Edgar Mitchell. NASA, on the other hand, has got a massive public relations problem. However, this is not then, this is now. And things are changing so fast, I cannot overstate this. And let me give you an example of this. Hang on, I'm gonna get you something here. Uh, let me just bring this up, just a moment. I had it right here, where'd it go? Let me just pull that down. Uh, well, that's CNN Business. Here is a uh, headline from CNN. NASA chief says agency is investigating UFOs. That is from, uh, I think, a couple months ago, right? Mm -hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? That's the first time that any NASA chief has ever said that. But he's not just any NASA chief. He is former Senator Bill Nelson, former astronaut Bill Nelson former member of the Senate Intel Committee, Bill Nelson, who I can say with high confidence was recently put on, made NASA's administrator specifically because NASA knew the game was almost up. The truth embargoes in was near and NASA's public relations problem was enormous. And so they needed to put somebody in who would be the right person to start putting NASA in another place, all right? And he has done that. And he's made statements that have never been made before, all right? Uh, and recently, just a, about a week ago, in science.com, science he was quoted as saying that he does believe there's other life, extraterrestrial life in the universe. And so, good for NASA. They, they finally got on the disclosure train. It was necessary. I'm glad that they're there. I'm glad that Bill Nelson is doing what he's doing. He will be well received by history. Mm. But let me be clear. There are those of us who are not ever going to forget that NASA has known about the ET presence since the day it was founded in 1958. I don't mean the secretaries working in the front office. I'm talking about key people involved in the management of NASA have known about the ET since 1958. Nevertheless, they went ahead and fully supported the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Over the years, they put millions of dollars into, sometimes it was private, sometimes it was public. The search for ET signals in the sky, which has never been reported ever since 58. What's that, 72 years? So at the same time, NASA is supporting the search for the ET signals. They know as the agency, as does the, the uh, uh, oh, I forget that other entity, I'll get it in a second. They've known the ETs were here since 58. And they, 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 they embarrassed Edgar Mitchell, mm -hmm. undermined Edgar Mitchell because he told the truth. They weren't particularly easy on Gordon Cooper either. I talked to his, his manager. It, it was not a, a fun ride for Gordon when he started speaking the truth about this. I'm interested in getting disclosure. I'm interested in the post-disclosure world. I am very forgiving. I support an amnesty uh, uh, project. I support truth and reconciliation. I will be generous. However, I'm not going to let the people and the historians and the politicians and the journalists in the post-disclosure world completely forget the fact 
that one of the absolute key components of the truth embargo, which goes back to 1947, was the silencing, the hamstringing, and the suppression of anything that NASA might do or say that would jeopardize that truth embargo. They basically contained our incredible space program and all the wonderful things it can do by one, not disclosing, which would have given NASA an unbelievable platform, mm. but also making mm. damn sure that NASA would not challenge the truth embargo. That needs to be known so that it never happens again. We don't need that kind of government controlling science that way. The Soviets had that kind of government. The Nazis had that kind of government. We don't want that kind of government in our own much nicer way. That's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and you may ask about the, the other question was about, you mentioned Mitchell, and then you wanted to know about something in addition with the nuclear, the nuclear witnesses? Nuclear weapon tampering by extraterrestrials, which... Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That's a fantastic question. I assure you the hearings will be about that a big time. Once you understand that that our weapons have been turned off and on by ETs going back to the mid 60s numerous times, not only here, but in Soviet Union and Russia, a reasonable person would ask why. That's a very significant question. Why? And the answer could be for the hell of it, you know? It's like kids on a Saturday night that just decide to go blow up some mailboxes with M80s. I and mean, just for the hell of it. I don't think so. I don't see the ETs as high school kids out for a, just a crazy Saturday night. So the hell of it is off the table. A, a clear defined threat, meaning we can do this anytime we want. So get ready, we're gonna be taking over very soon. We're gonna be running everything on the earth. You're gonna pretty much do, we're gonna tell you how high to jump. And I mean, to jump and you're gonna say how high. And if we don't like you, we're gonna blow, blow you all up. That's one possibility. Is there a lot of evidence supporting that particular why? No, it's not there. It's this, it's like this. There's a whole lot of evidence supports another possibility. A possibility which is shared by virtually all of the nuclear weapons tampering witnesses. The turning off of our missiles, the flying around in a saucer of a test missile traveling 8,000 miles an hour with a dummy nuclear warhead on it and shooting beams at it and knocking it off, which was reported by Robert Jacobs now many times, including on October the 19th, is not a threat in their view. It is a simple message. Why do you have nuclear weapons? What is it that you intend to do with them? Drop more of them on yourselves like you did in 1945? Only these are, you, did, you dropped two back then. Now you have a couple tens of thousands and they're much more powerful. Is that what you intend to do? Don't you see how ridiculous that is? And the other, the other message would be a sub message to that would be, we know that you have these factions that hate each other and you're just looking to destroy each other. You've been doing it for 10,000 years. We get that. But there may be some of you who are thinking, you know, it would probably be best if we got rid of these missiles. We buy all our cheap goods from China. Why would we want to blow them up, right? The Soviet Union dismantled and, and became just 14 republics, became Russia, even outlined the Communist Party, right? They're, became capitalists. They've got all kinds of capitalist billionaires over there. Why, why do you want to destroy them up? Plus you're getting a lot of, you're getting some resources for them. It may be that some of you think you need just to keep them around because of us, the ETs, that we might need to use them against the ETs one day. So let's just keep them, you know, 20, 30,000. There's no chance we'd accidentally use them. Actually, we almost have on about six occasions. We're just trying to let you know if that's what the reason or one of the reasons you're doing it, you need to maybe, I don't know, 
have a couple of tall ones and chill out. Go to a psychiatrist, get your head examined or whatever, because you will never use those nukes against us. We are interstellar. We are advanced civilizations. We got kids who can turn your nuclear weapons off using stuff that they play around with in the ninth grade. And so just want to send that message. That is the message that the nuclear weapons tampering witnesses who were there when it happened believe is the message. And that is what I believe is the message. Yeah, now, and I will concur if I may. You know, the people I have had who are extraordinary on Lisa Royal Holt and Bashar and, and many people who channel these extraterrestrials, plus all the books that I read from some very prominent people connected to all of this, they say three things from the extraterrestrial point of view about why tampering to turn off the nuclear weapons. First of all, um, their past. We are basically their past, right? And they are our, our future and they need us. They need our genetic material. They need us to be here. And the second thing is um, they're way, way, way far advanced than us. They already know what this leads to. This, is, this isn't some kind of guessing game. They're very clear how easily we can and stupidly we can wipe ourselves out. Right. And then there's repercussions because apparently what they do is not the kind of travel we do or like what you just recently did coming back from Washington where you got on a plane. That's ridiculous to them. You're talking about them going 8,000 miles an hour and all the Gs. And so for them, their travel is multidimensional. Like they're really going through portals to get here. And apparently should a nuclear bomb go off on this planet and wipe things out, it will impact their universe and their travel. And this is very important to them and their civilization. And finally, this interaction that they're here and wanting to have with us and that they are having with some, albeit so few people really considering how many on the planet they could, but this is really important to them and to us, this, is, this good cultural exchange. So all of those things, it's about preservation both ways for us, stu stupid <laughs> folks playing around with stuff like that, using our genius um, to create destruction instead of good. And mm -hmm. then for them as well, that this would impact their universe, their planet, their people and their travel, and they can't have it. There are a number of theories and sources of information that uh, people are drawing upon to try to assess that why question. Uh, here, here, I don't subscribe to all of them. I'm sure that doesn't surprise you, but here are a couple of things I, I somewhat am comfortable with and I will mention because I talked about the fact that uh, there is, other than just common sense, there is some support for the conviction that will be expressed in these hearings, I assure you. They will be asked and they will answer. Why do they turn these weapons off? Here are a couple things that I'm comfortable with. Okay. First of all, if you're, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're doing this to threaten the hell out of the, of the human race, why do you spend so much time putting crop circles down in the UK? I mean, these beautiful agroglyphs that you put down in the crops, right? It doesn't really hurt anybody. Uh, and, and people come and they take pictures of them, put them on their, uh, their refrigerators and so forth. And you do it year after year after year. What is this a ruse? It's like, we're, we're making you, it's, it's, a, it's a, what do they call it? A, uh, uh, it's a false flag. In other words, we're, we're trying to act like we're really cool. Here's some nice art, right? We do this. Beautiful, beautiful. We're so nice, we're so wonderful and so artistic, but really, we intend to destroy every living soul on the planet. <laughs> we fooled you. That's one. Okay. Two. And I don't, I go there with, I, I don't normally go here because my job is very political, very much in terms of moving the, the media in certain directions, getting stuff done in the hill. So I tend to confine myself. However, I do lots of interviews and I occasionally go into other areas. 
I'm pretty knowledgeable about contact, what I call mainstream contact, basic contact. Okay. ETs come, get you, take you up, things happen on the craft, bring you back. That's your basic. Then you get into what we'll call psychic contact or mental contact, which is it, it minimal telepathy. We know they're tele telepathic from the basic contact. And since we know that, you don't have to be necessarily in a room with them for them to talk to you. Okay, so and that, that, so that, but let's just stay with basic contact, just that, of which there have been who knows how many millions of these events, but it's a big number. The number of contactees that have checked in with researchers and we, we haven't been able to do a complete survey on this. It would be very difficult and cost a lot of money, but, but just talking and, uh, to a number of researchers and what they have said and so forth, the number of, of individuals around the planet, because these, these people, the, the reports come in from all over the world, uh, prime, to the researchers, some of which are outside the US, many are inside the US, is somewhere between a half a million and a million minimum. That's a lot of people, okay? And in that huge volume of, this is what happened to me, I just want to share it with you, there are some consistencies which are notable. Uh, there are some wild and crazy things which are notable too, but let's focus on the, the more very consistent things. And there is one of the consistencies which is extremely notable. And that is, Whatever else is happening on that craft in that particular visit, very often the individual, the human, is taken often to another room where they're, they're, they have some entertainment. Some entertainment is provided, all right? I guess you could say. It's pretty much only one channel. You don't get to switch channels. The point is, is that sometimes they, they see it in their mind. In other words, they, they project it in their mind. So, you know, like, like Oculus, right? Or sometimes they, they, it's on the, the side of the craft. Like you'll be sitting as a wall and you see it on the wall, like, like, like Samsung TV, right? And what are they showing? Old reruns of I Love Lucy? Uh, no. Consistently, they show them images of the future. Now, some contactees have concluded, and I, I, I don't blame them for this, that they're being shown the actual future because they believe ETs have the ability to do this or time travel. I, yeah, I, don't, I, I can't say that that's not true, but I, uh, I do have a degree in physics. I, I, I've, I've studied my share of science. I have a sense of science above, beyond normal, uh, typical. I have extreme doubt that time travel is possible. All right. I, it's, it's not out of the question. It's great for science fiction movies. I get it. I've seen them all. I love it. But from the standpoint of what we know about physics, there are a number of things we don't know how to do, but are very likely, like interstellar travel. And there are a number of things that we don't know to know that do that the chances of being possible are practically nil and time travel is one of them. So if they're not showing them the actual future, what are they showing? Them? The potential future, which is very easy to do. As a matter of fact, there's, I'm in Hollywood right now, there's probably 800 people in this town that could do a fantastic job of it and put it together in 24 hours. And what is the future they're showing them? They are showing them a world in a sort of devastated state, which in some ways seems to show that, that there's been a degradation of the environment or the biosphere uh, in terms of life and what have you. We've seen images like that. It's, it's all under the apocalyptic era. We're going through the era of apocalypse where you can't write enough books or do enough program, a series or movies about apocalyptic stuff. It's pouring out of our screens and televisions at a rate which far exceeds what would be a, a, a reasonable amount of content. The apocalypse content creators are literally servicing 
the psycho psychology and subconscious of the human brain. And we can go into that if you want to, but let's- And art it. imitates life, right? Well, let me put it this way. It's not just art imitating life, it's art servicing ne uh, neuroses, okay? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. If you've lived your entire life under the Damocles sword of nuclear annihilation at any time, you're gonna get neurotic. It's only a matter of how neurotic you're gonna get, okay? Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, but some of those images clearly intimate an aftermath of some sort of nuclear event. Mm -hmm. Now think about that. We're not talking about one or two. We're talking about tens upon tens of scores of thousands of individuals who I am 100% convinced, I mean, there may be the odd confabulator, 100 because are, are in fact contactees, did go on that craft or in some complex and did get, did see those images. Not one or two, but tens of thousands. Now, why, why would you do that? Why, why, you know, you've taken them out of their bed in the middle of the night. That's not cool. You've taken up in a craft. You, you may have scared the hell out of them, though you tend to calm them down. You may have even done a little table work on them. This is not fun. And so now, just to show your appreciation, you're gonna show them images of a future destroyed biosphere? Why would you do that? Unless you were really uh, cruel. I mean, this is really would be cruel, unnecessary, unless you were trying to make a point. Hmm. And here's the point I think they're making. If I'm wrong, send me an email with uh, your explanation of why I'm wrong or your, your firsthand information. Look, this is the message they're sending. Mm -hmm. We're interstellar. We travel the galaxy. We're engaging your planet, but this is not our first rodeo, folks. Right. We've seen all this before. It's like, it's like an advanced country uh, on the planet. We have 200 countries and they've been in various developments going back a long time. And so we have people in our country, diplomats, scientists, politicians, or watching some country do stupid stuff that's going to really cause them problems. And we, well, at least when we're in our helping frame of mind, as opposed to our let's invade and carpet bomb frame of mind, when we're on our helping frame of mind, we go and we might talk to some of their high leaders and say, you know, we've seen this before. It's happened before. It happened just a few years ago to that country. It happened 50 years ago to that country. We've been, we, we, we pay attention and you're going down that same road. Don't do that. So the message is, look, folks, this is where you're heading. You don't want to go there. And we're seeding this. We're telling people all over the planet as part of our contact work, whatever that is, we're showing them you don't want to go there. I assume with the idea that those people are going to tell other people. And, and that's what's exactly what is happening. As the contact phenomena started to explode in the late 70s and people started coming forward, these messages are going out in books and documentaries. It's spreading. So you can understand the logic there. But one might say, well, look, don't, don't tell me. I'm just a cashier at Denny's. Why don't you abduct that secretary of state or abduct the president or, or whatever, that Putin or whatever, take them up in the graph to show them the images. Maybe they have. But not surprisingly, as it's clear, the extraterrestrials are not willing to do things that would literally force disclosure on us, which they could do anytime they wanted. And so they have chosen to influence in us in various ways. Some would claim the influence is really big. I'm not there, but whatever. Okay. Put, 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 put beautiful crop circles down in the UK going, hey, this is sweet, we're, we're that's influencing us, uh, giving these messages of potential destruction if we don't change our ways to thousands of people around the world, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, influencing us, okay. In order to help us get somewhere and where do they want us to get to? They want us to get to disclosure. In other words, they want us to get us to the point, not only where we self-disclose their reality to ourselves, through our leaders, 
get up to speed on that, and then have open contact, and they would prefer that all this happens before we have a nuclear war. Now, you might say, well, seems like a lot of trouble to go through. Why don't they just melt every nuclear weapon down in the planet, which they could probably do, or turn them all off so they couldn't be turned on? That would eliminate the nuclear war thing, wouldn't it? It would also force, force disclosure on us from an external source, them, and scare the bejesus out of everybody. And they don't want to do that. So here's another example. There are so many things the ETs could do that would be incredibly upset us and have everybody in the planet on Xanax within a week. They don't do that. And on the other hand, you said, well, but, but we could have a nuclear war tomorrow. So, you know, they're kind of taking a risk. If they force it, maybe it would be uncomfortable, but, but uh, it would eliminate the risk, so why don't they do that? I don't know. I'll, I'll ask them if I get the chance, but I have one suggestion as to why. Here are the reasons. One, in terms of their safety, uh, we don't pose a threat to them. And again, I'm, these are my views. Other people have a more expanded view of that, but I I feel comfortable in saying that we pose zero threat to the extraterrestrials, except if we manage to shoot any down. And if we ever did that, we can't do that anymore, right? And there's some, there's some history there that's interesting. Um, we just can't do a damn thing to them, right? Uh, and we don't. Yeah, countless, untold thousands of encounters with ETs by our aircraft. We can't do anything. They can out, they can run rings around us, disappear, whatever. We're not a threat to them. So that's not the issue. Right. We are a threat to ourselves, but we're not a threat to them. Okay. So in that sense, they can take their time, but there's another reason. They're, from their point of view, the risk of engaging us at a level that would be extremely destructive outweighs the risk of a little more patience in terms of us getting to where we need to be, which is disclosure, open contact, and getting rid of the nukes. And so they're willing to take that risk. It's an equation that they, that's the solution they have to that equation. I'm cool with that. Okay, I'm cool with that. However, you might say, well, then this could go on indefinitely. No, here's why. Because their patience is not unlimited, but more importantly, there is a very good reason why it is not unlimited. And that reason explains a great deal about what's happening right now. And what is that reason? And I can't say this emphatically enough. The moment that the human race solves the problem of the relativity uh, uh, issue, in terms of interstellar travel and builds a craft mm. like theirs that can travel to the stars in a short amount of time, then we become a risk That's to right. them. Yes. And therefore those nukes can never make it onto one of those craft. And that day is coming soon. And therefore we are running out of time to do this the right way, to hold hearings, to see the evidence unfold, to have our wonderful leaders that we elected tell us the truth finally, and then learn about this issue and become comfortable with this issue so we can have open contact, and which I believe will lead to an immediate issue of, okay, you're gonna have to get rid of the nukes. We're running out of time for that. Now, look, if, Somebody said to me, Steve, the only way we're going to finally end this is when we get that interstellar craft about ready to be built, then they're going to force it on us, and that's the way it's going to happen. And I would say, well, okay, if that's the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be. And other people might say, okay, fine, let's just wait for that. Let's just wait till we build the interstellar craft, and the ET say, that's enough, here we are, let's have a talk, get rid of the nukes, you're never leaving this freaking solar system, except for one problem. And if anybody is reading the news, they should know this problem. 
We are on the edge of nuclear war right now. I mean, we are on the edge of it. Every single politician in Congress should be talking about every single day. We should have every political institute focused on it. We should have hearings on it. We should be all over it. Instead, we are obsessing, literally. And I'm not saying it's, uh, it's not a real issue. Oh, it is a real issue. We are utterly obsessed with the fact that the oceans are rising and we're starting to lose beachfront in Hawaii. And that there's some droughts in the west of the United States. And if this continues for another 10 or 20 years, things are gonna get dicey. We are just crazy about that. But we have virtually nothing to say. The Congress is doing nothing. The New York Times is doing nothing. The political institutes are doing nothing. Only the bullet of atomic scientists, God bless them, are staying on top of it about the fact that we are closer to nuclear war every single day. If, and I, I'm thinking about a project in which I am going to go and do my thing. I'm going to go into the archives and I am going to put up and save hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles from today going back to the year 2000, which show, indicate, that the situation regarding nuclear war has been getting worse every single day since the Cold War ended in 1991, but really accelerated in the year 2000. And I'm gonna put those out, I'm gonna start really complaining about them. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna say, look, go read these damn articles, okay? And so here's the deal, folks. If you, if you wanna obsess about global warming, that's okay. If you wanna obsess about anything, out there. You want to get angry and frustrated about all the terrible things that are happening and so forth. That's great. But if you are not pressing your political class to finally to, to address once and for all the nuclear weapons threat, start nuclear arms talks again and start giving these weapons, then you have no future. Your kids have no future. Your grandkids have no future. They will never have to worry about global warming really hurting their lives because we are not going to make it i don't think 10 more years definitely not 20 years 30 years forget about it nuclear war at this point is virtually inevitable the ets are trying to tell you this the nuclear weapons witnesses are trying to tell you this and the politicians are going a uh, nuclear weapons i uh what are those i'm not familiar with them do we have those did something happen in, in Japan in 45? I'm so busy dealing with, I don't know, the internet problem. I'm just not aware. If we do not get on that, all of these other issues are nothing. They're moot. Yes, agree. Absolutely nothing. Folks, wake up. Yeah. Forget the deep state, forget being woke, forget about all that stuff and the, all the, the stuff on the left and being woke and all the stuff on the right, which is, I don't know, pretty not good. Just focus on the most important thing right now is that your planet, your civilization, all of the major cut all, and the nine nuclear weapons holding countries are headed straight for nuclear war and your politicians and the journalists are not really telling you much about it, but it's all there if you look hard enough, deal with that. And, and hope to God that the theory that the intense developments in the ET UAP issue, which is being somewhat assisted by the ETs themselves, leading to hearings is as close as we think that hearings will lead to disclosure as quickly as we hope, and disclosure will lead to open contact as uh, sooner thereafter, and open contact or the, inter, inter, uh, the uh, uh, interstitial period between open contact, we will deal with the news. Hope for that, because that's, that's the thing that threatens you, your kids, your grandchildren, everything you like. Whether you're rich or poor, let me tell you, if you're one of those wealthy people living in a gated community with two yachts, six houses, and you think, oh man, I've got it made. I'll just say and do whatever I want. I'll support any politician I want. I'll throw money in any issue I want, no matter how awful they are, because I'm untouchable. Forget it. 
to all those wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people, and you probably haven't read any articles recently, but for a while there, it was really huge. They're building luxury bunkers underground mm -hmm. so they can survive that nuclear war they kind of figured out already. Oh man, I've seen pictures of them. Some of them have swimming pools. So the rich are building underground bunkers so they'll be okay. They, uh, they, they, they somehow nobody told them about metal detectors. So after the nuclear war, the, the survivors are going to have really good metal detectors and they're going to be looking for those bunkers all over the place. And when they find them, they're going to dig down and drag those very wealthy people up. And at, they're probably not going to be nice to them. And so even the underground bunker thing is nonsense. It is stupidity of the highest order, unless you just want it to be kind of a getaway so you can chill out once in a while. Look, the logic, the madness, the insanity needs to stop. We need to see the reality the way it is, which includes the presence of extraterrestrials. We need to work from the basic concepts and common sense, and we can get out of this mess. But we're running out of time. I'm doing all I can, folks. I need all the support I could get, right? But, you know, I only got so much. Robert Bigelow, God bless him, has helped this issue along. He's sent, he's giving two million, uh, how many millions of dollars? Several millions of dollars to people to write essays about consciousness. Great. I would have preferred he gave essay and millions of dollars to people to write essays on how the hell we're going to avoid a nuclear war. But he, it's his money and by God, he can spend it any way he wants. And Bezos is going into semi-space and whatever. It's their money. They can spend it any way they want. But ask yourself, how can people that smart, that wealthy, who are engaging space itself, Elon, have nothing to say about the fact our nuclear weapons are being turned off and the risk of nuclear war is imminent? Is, is that why Elon wants to go to Mars? Is that why he keeps telling us we, our future is in Mars? Because he knows we're gonna have a nuclear war and he wants to help us get some people up there so the human race can survive after the nuclear attack, the nuclear war? I hope to God that's not the reason that Elon wants to go to Mars because that would be beyond crazy. Elon has the power to help the problem down here that would make us need to be on Mars. And he needs to focus on that. Not that I have any right to tell Elon Musk what to do. He's a genius, he's brilliant, the guy's amazing. He's gonna go down in history. I'm just saying folks, this whole ET issue is a convex giant um, magnifying glass. That if you look in it, it focuses you right down on what's really important if you bother to look, kind of like Galileo's telescope allowed you to see so much more than you knew, this magnifying glass needs to show us what we absolutely have to know. Mm. Wow. You brought us right here to the end. I really As appreciate I your... <laughs> When, and I want to say to your point, or really a little bit off topic, but also partly to the point, since we last saw each other, and I had mentioned to you when I hung out with you that I was going in October to Arizona to a contact retreat with somebody um, globally known, and uh, it's not entirely open to the public, but it's a very intimate group. And I went and I saw craft for the second time in my life. And I, no one's more befuddled by this than me because of where I came from in my mindset. And I keep having this sense that there's an awareness that I exist, that I'm even putting a mouthpiece to this and that they're allowing me to believe in the little, little piece crumb that I'm putting out into the world with people like you, whose passion it is to speak the truth, pull back the curtain and show what's really going on. But I can mm -hmm. testify, this is now my second experience, it's beyond the beyonds to see a craft in the sky. I mean, it's a life-changing experience. So- It is, it is I've lost, 
my mouse. I can't believe I lost my mouse. Look, I just put up a post on my Facebook page. Uh, you know, without a mouse, I'm basically nothing. <laughs> uh, oh, here it is. <laughs> Back. Okay, I, I put this up on my Facebook page. You're gonna like this. Uh, I, I saw a video and uh, it is a little four minute video uh, from an even larger uh, video about this, right? It's about a recent study that finished up about 12 months ago. And it is an absolutely amazing uh, act of science and intellect and everything else. I'm gonna bring it up right now. And it's about the, um, wait a minute, it should, should wait, oh, 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 no, no, hang on a second, hang on a second, I know where it is, I know where it is. Uh, this went out in an update I just put out. Are you uh, gonna try to show it, Steve? Because if you are, I need to give you access. I don't think I, well, you mean you mean a share thing on the page, you share the page? Yeah, I can give okay. you, um, I can make you a co-host, which is now done. And so right. now you can share screen. So for those folks who are listening to this as a podcast, I'm sure you're gonna to wanna to see the visual of this. And then you wanna to go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. So you could have the additional joyous pleasure mm -hmm. of seeing okay. us in the flesh what animated, and then also see what Steve is gonna show. Okay, well, I'm gonna show just a, just a short part of the video, just a little bit. And then I'm going to show you what I wrote about it. This is about a, I think, a 20 year effort to map the entire universe in 3D. How about that? Uh, and it, it, the technology is unbelievable. I didn't even know it existed. Uh, so uh, that's cool. And I'm bringing it up now. Almost there, almost there. Oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna do this. All right. Um, all right, hang on a second. Uh, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it back and I'm going to stop it. Can you share me now? Let yes, me know when you I'm have shared. access. So click on share screen on the bottom. Okay, and then on. click on what part of your computer it is on that you're going to share with us. Gotcha. I haven't done a lot of sharing, so I'm, I'm, I, I need to work on my sharing, but I, I will I will get better at it. Okay, share. Oh, there it is. Okay, I'm clicking. Okay, and then I want to go to, uh, uh, where is it? Yeah, so it'll pull up everything on your desktop and yep. browsers. Yep. So click on the, whatever shows the video. I think it's this, okay, share. Make okay. it PG, Steve. Can you see it? Yep. It share? Okay, all right, Here, here's just a little bit of this video. Can you hear sound? Very muted, but it says on July 20th, 2020, scientists from the extended baryon oscillation. Hang on. A spectroscope. That I'm went by the, fast. I'm going to take the sound up. I'm going to take the sound up. Hang on. Okay. Uh, yeah, folks, you want to go for sure to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger to watch. All right. And I'm going to take, all right. This may be a little bit better. Okay. Uh, am I still shared? Yes, you are. Okay. Still shared. Okay. Start over. Here we go. I'm going to read it. July 20th, 2020, scientists from the Extended Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey released a comprehensive analysis of the largest 3D map. This marks the culmination of a successful 20-year era of cosmology surveys with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And we are now looking at the SDSS uh, telescope. Um, they're distributed all over the world, There's not, at least 10 different countries with, with participating members. And in particular, we have people in New Mexico who really run the experiment day to day. And they really put in the most amount of work making this a successful experiment. Their findings confirm the standard model of cosmology at distances never before probed, mapping the structure curve. 
this model describes how, on the largest scale, as we can see, the universe evolves. So EVOS is designed to measure the three-dimensional positions of galaxies. One of the techniques we use um, with EVOS data Look at that. to measure the expansion of the universe is called the Barrett Higgins Constellation Technique. This uses a standard ruler in the distribution of galaxies. And we use this scale to measure the accelerating expansion of the universe. It is considered an incredibly robust technique within the community. When the light of the distant galaxy propagates through space, it is stretched by the expansion of the universe, which changes wavelengths and makes it redder, and this is known as the redshift. So the further the galaxy is, the greater the redshift will be, and that allows us to infer the distance. However, the redshift has an additional component that is due to the small contribution of the galaxy's own velocity, and which moves in response to the gravitational attraction of the surrounding matter. And these two components cannot be really separated from each other, but the statistical analysis of the data from the EVOS allow us to distinguish these effects of the velocity from that of expansion. The biggest challenge of EVOS is sheer size of the project. There's machinery with many, many moving parts. And those parts are being run all over the world. Even we're actually running observations week after week, year after year, five years, and serving you know, over 1,000 independent fields. We have to make sure that's all done uniformly, consistently, in a way that we understand the entire of the system. We have many analyses going on. Uh, projects, you know, analysis being done in different countries, being done by different people, um, and you have to have this network where everyone finds an agreement on how to proceed in final measurement and make sure that everything's understood that they're the deployment system. That allow us to accurately reconstruct the history of the expansion and the growth structure of the universe over a cosmic time of about 11 billion years and covering almost 80% of the entire age of the universe. So it's really exciting times. People push into galaxies that are further away from us than the previous people looked at. And we find that even for these galaxies, this standard thing is. Let's end it there, Steve. I'll tell you why the sound is nebulous at best. So for okay. those who are listening to the podcast, um, they'll, okay. they'll have to go check out, they can YouTube the SDSS releases largest 3D map of the universe ever created. But thank you, totally fascinating. Well, um, let, me, let me say this about that though, something I wanna add. It's important, hang on just a second. Let me go uh, to here. Uh, Bring this up. Um, so they, they looked at 11 billion years, the act, which is 80%, the quote age, unquote, of our galaxy is based on how far we can see. It's 13 billion years. All right. So I I posted this a moment. Sorry. And I, this is what I had to say, and I'll be putting this out on, uh, uh, I'll be putting this out on uh, my, my uh, uh, let me just go back on this. All right, God, just a second. Oh yeah, okay, this is, this is what I put out. Should you watch this video, here are some things to ponder, one. The human race is mapping the universe and we are quite, quote, ready, unquote. Two, if, and a lot of people don't, haven't thought about this. If we live near the edge of the universe, our map would be shorter in one direction than in another. It isn't. It's 13 billion years in all directions. We have no idea where the center is. We are not the center of the universe. We there could we could be there could we could be a hundred million billion light years from what might be the center. We have no idea how big the universe is, but the universe we can see. And here's what I say: 
what we see has more than seven times 10 to the 22nd stars or 76 trillion stars. And lastly, the most absurd thought you can carry in your head is, quote, we are alone. And the point I'm making is this, Debbie, when you or anybody else is out doing a CE5 and see something or just going to get lunch and look up and there's a craft and you see it, the fundamental effect that's having on you, that that, that gets to you, that goes right down deep, is that in that instance, you are reminded, maybe for the first time or maybe another time, that we are not alone in this universe. And that thought, that concept that actually we are not alone in this universe is probably as profound a thing as anybody could think. And they've been suppressed from thinking that and told not to think about and denied that by our own government decade after decade after decade, just like the Catholic Church denied that there's well anything out there that they don't already know or the earth is at the center of the universe for 200 years. That's the feeling you have. And let me tell you, if you look at the world today and the situation it's in and what we need to do, all I can say is not enough people can come to feel that to come to know that, that whatever you think about this planet and other people and what's going on and how many fears you have, we are not alone. And if we would just pay attention more, we may actually get to meet some of those other beings. They, may, they are here right now. And so that's why I put that up. And that's why you felt that way. And we can't have enough people feeling that way and it can't happen too soon. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much for coming back on the show and for further conversation. I look forward to more in the future as always. And I point everybody to learn more about Steve Bassett and the amazing work he's doing. Go to paradigmresearchgroup.org. And I end today's show with this quote from the Dalai Lama, who, by the way, has been very vocal recently about his thoughts on extraterrestrials. And the quote is this, we Buddhists have always held that firm conviction that there exists life and civilization on other planets in the many systems of the universe. And some of them are so highly developed that they are superior to our own. Please subscribe, like, leave a comment. And next week on this number one weekly transformation conversation, Dare to Dream podcast, my guest is Captain Randy Kramer. Captain Randy Kramer was an officer who has been given authorization to address the public on behalf of a covert special section of the United States Marine Corps. Randy discusses his 17 year tour of duty off world on Mars and his years serving aboard a secret space fleet. I really look forward to that. Again, you can subscribe, let your friends know about the show and thank you so much for joining us. Help Steve out and all the great work he's doing. Become a follower and listen to his message as well as go to his website if you'd like to donate. Thanks for joining us and remember, to dare to dream way beyond this universe.